concavity. That's what we're going to look at today. Now, the first derivative, when we're looking at a graph, we found the first derivative measures the slope of the curve, or more particularly the slope of the tangent at that point. Okay, now if a derivative measures a rate of change, we know that to be true, then the second derivative must measure the rate in change of the first derivative. So if we're talking about a graph, we're saying, how does the slope change? That's what we call concavity. That's the name we give it. So if the second derivative is greater than zero, then the curve turns out to be concave up. So like a happy parabola, if you like. Have a look at our happy parabola over the side here and have a look at what's happening to the slope as we move from left to right. It starts out, it's negative and it's reasonably steep. But as we move, it's getting shallower and shallow and shallow. We start with a very steep uh, slope and it's staying negative but getting shallower until we get to the bottom where it's now zero and then the slope starts being positive and it's shallow and it gets steeper and steeper and steeper. So it's increasing the value of the slope and that's why the second derivative is greater than zero. So consequently, if it was upside down, it would be going the other way. So if the second derivative is less than zero, we know the rate of change of that uh, slope is uh, de decreasing, getting smaller and smaller. Now, if it's equal to zero, then that's where we have what we call a possible point of inflection. So the point where it changes from concave up to concave down or vice versa. All right. So let's just have a look at our second derivative, and we're going to get a rough sketch of this cubic. We're only going to use the second derivative. Of course, we have to find the first derivative to find the second derivative. So there's the first derivative. Second derivative is 6x plus 10. Okay, we know it's going to be concave up when that's positive or greater than zero. So if we solve that little inequality, we know whenever the x values are greater than minus 5 on 3, we have a concave up curve. Mark in minus 5 on 3, so we know on the right hand side of that the curve is going to be concave up. On the left hand side, logically, it's going to be concave down. So I say it's a very rough sketch, but we know the curve must do something like that. So where exactly the y-intercept is and the x-intercept, I, I don't know. We could work it out, I suppose, but if we want a rough idea of what the curve looks like, we could just use the second derivative and come up with something like that. This now allows us to classify those stationary points without actually having to use the table of values. Because if we combine the idea of, yes, I know it's a stationary point, but I also know the curve is concave up, then the logical conclusion is it must be a, a minimum turning point. So first of all, all turning points are going to be stationary points. So we have to locate the stationary points first. Then we classify them. So the second derivative, if it's greater than zero, yeah, it's concave up. So here's the turning point down the bottom. Must be a, a minimum turning point. And if it's concave down, now my turning point's up here at the top. So it's a maximum turning point. It's all right. Let's now look at this particular one, x cubed plus x squared minus x plus 1. Again, we have to use the first derivative. We're also going to need the second derivative because that's what we're going to use to classify them. Again, explain what you're doing and you're working out. All right, first thing I'm doing is I'm trying to locate those stationary points. I know the stationary points will occur when the derivative is equal to 0. So I want to solve this particular quadratic. And solving that, we get our two values of one third and minus one. Now, rather than drawing up the table of values, I can now say, well, hang on a sec. When x is equal to minus one, the second derivative turns out to be negative. It's negative four. So I know it's concave down. So thus, I can conclude that minus one, two must be a maximum turning point. As I say, it saves drawing up the table of values. Let's check the other one out. When x is equal to a third, we end up with positive four which is greater than zero, so we know it's concave up. That must be a minimum turning point. 
Now that's not to say that the table of values is still not a useful idea. If you've got something that's a bit tricky to differentiate or something like that, rather than spending time finding that second derivative, it might be quicker just to test either side with the first derivative. So it just depends on the function that you're playing with. Let's talk a bit about these inflection points then. So a point of inflection, so that's where the second derivative is equal to zero. So where it changes concavity, because logically you can't move from positive to negative without being zero. Assuming the curve is continuous, of course. Well, just like we did with the uh, first derivative, we wanted to find that we can draw up a table of values, see what's happening either side. So let's use this one as an example. 4x cubed plus 6x squared plus 2. So we'll need our first derivative. We'll need our second derivative. Possible. And it's really important that you use the word possible points of inflection. It might not be a point of inflection. Think of the curve y equals x to the power of 4. Right? We know what that looks like. It's a basic curve. At the origin, we have a turning point. First derivative, 4x cubed. Okay, yes, it's a stationary point. Second derivative, 12x squared. But at x equals 0, that's equal to 0. Hang on, inflection point? That's why it's possible point of inflection. We don't know for sure until we test and find out. So possibly we have one at minus a half. Now, again, using a bit of logic, we know it has to be because we're talking about a cubic here. It's a continuous curve and every cubic has an inflection point. And as I've only come up with one solution, that must be it. But let's test it. So same as we did before, but now with the second derivative. So minus a half, zero, there's no concavity there. We'll pick a point on the left and we'll pick a point on the right. So on the left, I went with negative one which is minus 12, so that would be concave down. The right-hand side, I'll use zero, it's a very easy number to substitute. I end up with positive 12. So yes, look, I know it's changing concavity. It's uh, going from concave down to concave up. So yes, there is a change in concavity. So minus half three is a point of inflection. Okay. Now there's this special type of point of inflection a horizontal point of inflection. So that's a, an inflection point, which is also a stationary point. Uh, the most classic example of that, of course, is the, the cubic. You see, not all points of inflection are stationary. Think of your tan curve. It inflects, but at the point of inflection, the tangent would actually be at 45 degrees. So it's not a horizontal point of inflection. So a horizontal point of inflection is where the tangent would be horizontal, hence the name. So we know the first derivative would equal zero. It is a point of inflection, so we know the second derivative equals zero. And then, of course, it means the third derivative is, whoa, what? Third derivative? What, what's he talking about? I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Okay. Uh, by the way, you won't find this in the textbook. I don't know why people don't use it. Um, you'll find some teachers are really scared about it. Go, Ooh. But if you think about it logically, it makes sense. So an alternative way of finding those inflection points. So yes, we still know the possible points of inflection occur when the second derivative equals zero. But how do we define a point of inflection? We said that was where concavity changes. Gosh, if only we had some mathematical operation that measured change. A derivative does. So logically, the third derivative would measure the change in the second derivative. In fact, the actual rule is this. If the first time you get a non-zero derivative, so you substitute the number in and you don't get the answer zero. If it happens to be an odd order, so third derivative, fifth derivative, seventh derivative, depending on how complicated the function is, but if the first time you get zero is on an odd one, it's a point of inflection. Now, the ones we're going to look at, the third derivative is going to be enough. 
Um, but technically, that's what it is. And if it was of even order, then it won't be a point of inflection. Okay? Then it won't be a point of inflection. But as I say, if you think of the logic of the mathematics behind it, it must be true. So, let's go back to our example. We got a nice easy one, because the third derivative is 24. And last time I checked, 24 does not equal zero. And that's all I need to know, it does not equal zero. Just think about it. If it was equal to zero, we were saying there is no change. Any other number, doesn't matter if it's positive or negative, any other number means there is a change happening. So that's all we need to know. So this is where I'll, I'll get you to be real careful. If you're going to use this idea, you write this conclusion down. So you're saying, hey, uh, I know this means there is a change in concavity. You write that down and then you can say, ah, well, therefore, this must be a point of inflection. But just like I said with the first derivative, if you've got some complicated function to differentiate, then OK, let's stick with the second derivative and test either side. In fact, if you think about it, you could actually use the first derivative to test if there's an inflection point. Because if we know it's going increasing, stationary increasing, well, it must be a point of inflection. So you could actually use the first root to do the test. So 10E is the exercise.